Let's take a walk through the code in this LabVIEW project. We'll begin by reviewing the overall structure and then come back to the details after that. We're looking at RT main. This is the home security system, and I'm going to be focusing attention here on the queued state machine implementation. The home security system is an example of the queued message handler design pattern, and each uh, loop that you're looking at is a queued state machine. We begin by obtaining a queue and giving it a name, and then this wire carries a reference to the queue. It is not the queue itself, simply a reference to the queue. Here, the very first state is, in, is enqueued, and that state is initialize. Now, looking at the loop itself, we see something known as the guard clause and then a kernel. Looking at the guard clause first, the queue reference is an input, and the guard clause, when uh, a message is enqueued, will deliver that to the kernel. Any internally generated error is passed back around to the input of the guard clause VI, and then that error is forwarded to the error handler. Under normal circumstances, the guard clause VI produces the desired state to the command parser kernel, which accepts a data input cluster, potentially modifies that cluster, and then passes that back for the next loop iteration. You can look at various desired variables in that data cluster and display those on the front panel. When the command parser receives the shutdown message, that activates the loop stop condition, and then the queue is destroyed. All right, let's take a look at the details of the guard clause VI first. We'll double click that to open it up and then control E to see the block diagram. The input error cluster is wired directly to the selector of the case structure. Under the no error situation, we accept the reference to the queue, and when an element is available, we dequeue that as the message. The queue reference is duplicated on the output for convenience. When the error cluster contains a true status, the queue reference is simply passed through unchanged, the error itself is enqueued as an element into the error handler's queue. And then the message returned is a string error. It's important that the execution mode of this VI be set to pre-allocated clone re-entrant. Press Control i and then select Execution, and then you can choose that option. This guarantees that, the, uh, that each instance of the VI runs independently of every other, and this is required for multiple queued state machines that are all running in parallel in the same VI. Now let's take a look at the details of the kernel VI. Each queued state machine contains a kernel that is similar in overall structure but then it contains the specific behavior that is unique to each queued state machine. We'll look at the command parser as an example. And we'll begin with the error cluster. Again, this is connected to the case structure. This implements standard error behavior in which we uh, do no activity if there's an incoming error. Otherwise, we do the desired activity. Looking at data in, this is a custom control and it's defined as a strict type definition and it contains a cluster of um, variables and altogether these are referred to as the data highway. Depending on the particular state, the kernel will then modify one or more of these variables on the data highway. Here we have the incoming state that was returned by the guard clause. This goes through a VI called state and args and this simply splits apart the two into the state and then the arguments or parameters and these are separated by the colon. The state is used as the case selector. And we have standard states that begin with an uppercase letter, such as initialize, shutdown, and error. And application-specific states begin with a lowercase letter. 
The default case handles a situation where an unrecognized state string is presented to the case structure. In this case, the error unknown state VI is invoked. This accepts the state as well as determining the queue name and uses this information to form a custom error, which is returned as the error output. Now let's take a look at the details of these individual states, and I'll begin with the standard states, in this case, initialize. We see that it replaces the data highway entirely with the initial values. It also, in this particular case, is enqueuing the state called wait for connection. So eventually we would be going to that state in this case structure. The shutdown case generates a true on the stop output, and that's ultimately used to stop the queued state machine process loop. The error case deals with anything that might need to happen as a result of generating an, an error internal within the queued state machine. In addition to these standard states, then we have the application specific states. So for the command parser, we have wait for connection, connected, and disconnect. All right, I'm going to leave this kernel and move on to a little bit simpler one to consider some basic techniques for working with a data highway. Looking for the sensors kernel. And we'll look at its application specific state, which is monitor. So we see the incoming cluster, the data highway. You can use unbundle by name to pick off one or more of the variables from the data cluster. Do calculations as needed, and then when you have values that you'd like to reinsert back into the cluster, you use bundle by name. So you take the incoming data cluster, and then you can modify selected values and then pass that out. All right, let's consider some of the various methods you have available to enqueue states. We'll come back to the command parser for this purpose. Looking at initialize, we see an example of an unconditional state transition. That is, you just say, go to wait, wait for a connection, uh, and that's always enqueued. We might have other situations where, depending on specific conditions, we enqueue one state or another. So this would be an example of a conditional state transition. And here's another example of a conditional transition that's based on the data selector and it uses a Boolean condition to choose connect or disconnect. Again, this would be an example of an unconditional transition in this state. Now, many times a state does not need to enqueue a new state for itself. That is, it waits for another system or another queued state machine to enqueue a state. For example, the initialized state in the timer would simply wait in this initialized state until some other queued state machine indicates that it should advance to the run state. Now here we see something interesting. We're in the run state and it's possible to regenerate the same state. Again, we're in the run case, and then we, depending on the conditions, we might regenerate that case. Now, it's important to recognize that once that state is enqueued, the guard clause will produce it immediately. And you need to then insert a wait function into the process loop to pace the loop. Otherwise, it would run uh, at an incredibly fast rate. Now, everything I've showed you so far has involved a given queued state machine and queuing states for itself. You can also enqueue states for other queued state machines. You can choose the name of the queued state machine's queue and then the value or the message, and these are separated by a forward slash. You can do multiple messages as a string array, or you can do a single message as just one string. Some state messages can include the optional parameter or argument, which is separated by a colon. So the state in args vi picks off the state, and then it also separates out the optional parameter, which in this particular kernel is used as the case selector for a secondary case structure. To handle the 
situation of a mistyped parameter, the error unknown parameter VI forms a custom error message that's based on the queue name, the state, and the parameter. This case structure also uses the case insensitive technique. You see the little indicator right there in the lower left corner. And if you right click and choose case insensitive match, that can be an option that you might want to consider. Press Control F to search for these strings, such as states and optional parameters, to search for them by name. Searching for text is really easy. Then this way you can see all the instances of that particular text, and then you can use Control G to bounce from one to the next. And so that way you can quickly navigate the entire project. I'm going to finish up by showing you some tips for working with this LabVIEW project. We have some folders for the support VIs and then the type definitions. These are called auto-populating folders. I'll show you how to make one of those. If you create a new virtual folder and then choose the option to convert to an auto-populating folder, then anytime you add or subtract VIs from that folder, it automatically updates in the Project Explorer window. We see a number of type definitions. I'll show you how you can edit one of these if you need to add or re remove a variable. So simply, in this case, extend some space on the cluster, and then you place a new variable within that cluster. Give it a name, and you're ready to go. Here's how you create a new type definition. You say New Control, and then choose the option for Strict Type Definition. Begin by placing a cluster. And give the cluster a name. And then you start placing variables inside that cluster. Click here to change the artwork. And then finally, you can do Control S to save, or if you close the control, you'll be prompted to save that with the appropriate name.